Hey guys, I wasn't naked. That's fake news. Yeah, so it seems that the first stream got taken out, taken down rather, because of the thumbnail, which was just a beautiful classical painting, with which unfortunately featured some new pe nude people, and that might have thrown the Google algorithm off. Um, so yeah, hopefully this is going to be better. I'll just need to figure out a um, different thumbnail. But unfortunately, or fortunately for some people, pine points stay what they were. So a thousand pine points to Greyback, 500 uh, pine points for uh, Chris, and of course 250 for Roman, uh, or I should say Roman, uh, who is... No, actually, he's not leading. Uh, Greyback is leading, so congratulations. Um, so anyway, in this stream, we are going to be talking about coitus, and specifically, we are going to be talking about the divine conception of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke and in the Gospel of Mark, because it's Christmas season, so we are just keeping with the theme, the festive theme of the season. And specifically, I will be drawing some comparisons between the nativity narrative in the canonical gospels and uh, some of the myths of conceptions of gods and heroes in the Greco-Roman world. And of course, you might be asking yourself, am I really doing this? Like, am I going, really going to regurgitate the same nonsense that brilliant Christian apologists, such as inspiring philosophy, debunked years ago, right? If you actually go, for example, to his YouTube channel, uh, you will see the entire series, an entire playlist, where he compares Jesus to various uh, mythical heroes from the past. And he, and he, of course, finds out that they are completely different, and there are actually no similarities whatsoever. Uh, for example, uh, these other mythical divine heroes are not named Jesus, so clearly, there are absolutely no similarities, right? And in fact, you can form a valid deductive syllogism where the first premise is if a um, hero or a god from Greco-Roman um, pantheon shares no similarities with Jesus, share, shares a dissimilarity with Jesus, then he shares no similarities with Jesus. Uh, the second premise is a given Greco-Roman hero shares a dissimilarity with Jesus, and the conclusion is he therefore shares no similarity with Jesus. That's just logically valid, right? Uh, can't argue with that. Uh, that's just basic logic, right? So am I really going to repeat again how Jesus, for example, is just plagiarized Horus, and how Christmas is just a copy of Saturnalia? Like, how many videos... Uh, inspiring philosophy and other apologists who are covering this will have to make before people like me know any better. Well, um, I just want to kind of do uh, something a little bit different, right? Uh, because I was thinking about how to better communicate this idea that Jesus shares some, and the way how Jesus is described in the canonical Gospels happens to share some similarity with how other um, figures of literature from the same period and the same geographical space, um, the way how they are depicted, right? So I was thinking about like a novel way how to do it, and I think I might actually found a... Uh, an innovation, right? And I want to try it today. Uh, but first of all, what we are uh, talking about, right? So everyone knows that in pagan uh, religion, when a god produced a child, uh, either a god themselves, right? So the child was a god as well, or a goddess, or whether they actually produced a hero, which was a divine being of a lower status, um, somewhere in between a god and a human, uh, that would be normally a product of a god um, having coitus with a mortal woman, 
or a man, uh, right? Because goddesses could actually uh, produce heroes as well. Um, then, of course, everyone knows that it's very sexually explicit, that there is actually sex involved, there is actually penetration involved, involved, and it's very often rape, right? And, of course, we all know that in the canonical Gospels, this is not the case. Uh, Mary if, is, of course, virgin, and she stays a virgin, which is a very important point in um, Christian theology. And no Christian in their right mind, right, would suggest that uh, anything other than that was what actually happened. And no pagan author would suggest that the way how gods produced children was anything other than sexual intercourse, right? Well, wrong. Uh, so I'm here to show you that actually, by the time the Gospels were written, the idea that the gods have coitus, that they actually engage in sexual intercourse, was already repairing conflicts, having disputes with each other, right? So for example, and this is something that we already covered, in the Iliad of Homer, uh, there is, in Book 21, there is a scene when the battle between the Trojans and the Greeks actually intensifies so much that the gods who favor each various, uh, like each favor a different side. So for example, Athena is with the Greeks, Aphrodite is with the Trojans. Um, the fighting just intensifies so much that they get personally involved. They get down there on the battlefield and they start fighting. They line up according to their allegiances, just took it out, right? And they even call each other names. Uh, so here, for example, Hera uh, basically name calls Artemis, and she even beats her up with her own bow. Um, so surely this is something that we don't find in the Bible, right? Um, so first of all, there's just one God in the Bible. Everyone knows that, right? It's not like the Old Testament affirms that there are multiple different deities. And it's not like God actually does physical combat in the Old Testament, right? Right? You sure 100% about that? Uh, but in any case, uh, this, and this is something that we've already showed uh, in previous streams as well, uh, was rejected by the time Christianity uh, became a thing. And there were various authors who objected against the idea that God specifically would be in discord, that they would be in disharmony. So this is just uh, from a dialogue that we covered in one of our previous streams, right? Uh, so here we have a pagan specifically criticizing the poets, uh, which would include, most importantly, Homer, saying... Uh, not much more absurd than these are the fables of the poets who owe um, all their power of doing harm to the sweetness of their language, who have represented the gods as enraged with anger and it inflamed with lust. So here uh, we can tie it even more closely to the topic of today's stream. Uh, so we are, of course, talking about the pagan gods having intercourse. But here we have a pagan author uh, expressing basically disagreement with the idea that the gods are moved with, by lust, by passion. Um, so this is uh, something that was already rejected. Uh, and this is, by the way, 1st century BCE, so even before uh, the birth of Jesus, right? And not only were there people who rejected it, there were already apologists for these kind of stories, right? So there were some. Uh, pagan authors who rejected the poets, for example, Homer, but they were different um, pagan authors who defended them. They were essentially apologists, right? How did they defend them? Well, uh, they employed some of the same strategies that, for example, Christian apologists employ today. Uh, they harmonized it, uh, sorry, they uh, allegorized it. And so very early on, already uh, probably the first one, at least the first one that we have on record is of course, Theagenes of uh, Region in southern Italy, who supposedly, his work is not preserved, but from uh, various fragments that we have from them, uh, basically tried to rehabilitate, tried to rescue Homer by uh, allegorizing the various things that are taking place in the Iliad and the Odyssey, right? So it's not the case that there are actually gods who are in discord. There, of course, are gods. The gods are real. 
But when Homer describes how they are arguing and fighting, he isn't describing something that we could actually see if we traveled back in time. He's just allegorizing it in order to tell a story. And we find the same set of responses to a similar situation already in very early Christianity. By the second and third century, uh, there was this problem, for example, with atrocities in the Old Testament. I'm not sure we don't we have to go. I'm sure we don't have to go that much in depth about that. There are other YouTube channels who cover that in detail. Uh, and again, we see a wide range of responses from various authors. We have early Christian authors who deal with the problem of atrocities, which are obviously at odds with some conceptualizations of the Christian God, uh, by rejecting the Old Testament. That would be, for example, Marcion of Sinope, right, who actually concluded that there must have been two gods. Uh, one of them is the god of the Old Testament, who is evil, because the god of the New Testament, who is loving, uh, all loving, could not have possibly uh, committed atrocities described in the Old Testament. So that would be uh, an equivalent of um, someone like uh, Xenophanes, that's just rejection, and then the apologetic uh, response would be someone like Origenes, uh, Origen, in the third century, who actually just allegorizes the entire uh, Canaan conquest, for example. He writes homilies on the book of Joshua, where he explains that, no, there wasn't actually genocide going on. The whole book is actually an allegory. It tells a story that didn't happen in history, but it paints this word picture, and it's actually all about Jesus, uh, don't you know, right? The story of Canaan, and the, the slaughter of the Amalekites. That was actually all a uh, allegorical retelling or f and foretelling of the story of Jesus. So Joshua, of course, Jesus in Hebrew, same name, right? And he goes on to to explain how uh, Joshua going around conquering various people, slaughtering women and children and stuff like that, is actually allegory for spiritual combat, right? Uh, it's when you put on the armor of God, you are not putting on an actual armor. You are just putting a spiritual armor, right? For a spiritual battle, not for actual blood bloodshed. And when you are uh, fighting people, you are not fighting uh, rulers. You are fighting the powers and principalities. So it's not a combat with an actual physical army. It's a combat with a spiritual army. Uh, so let's see if everything works uh, with the stream. I think it does. I think we might have dropped off, uh, but now it seems to be okay. So yeah, that's just what I wanted to say um, at the beginning. And so let's circle back to the original uh, topic, right? So we are going to be talking about how certain pagan authors, by the time Christianity arrives, uh, became uh, convinced that the traditional, let's say, depiction of intercourse by divine beings, it's very implausible, and how they uh, rejected it. And I was just thinking about how to get the idea across that there are similarities between early Christianity and these pagan religions. Because, of course, not just apologists, but even Christian scholars are, want to deny that. If you read, for example, N.T. Wright or uh, Larry Hurtado, um, not to be confused with Nelly Furtado, uh, when he writes about it, when they write about it, it seems to me they are constantly moving the goalpost, right? So they will say, yeah, okay, this like on the surface looks similar, but if you actually dig deep enough and if you construct the uh, the depiction of the pagan theology on one hand and the Christian theology on the other hand, you will find differences on they will, or they will just gesture towards differences uh, in different areas, right? And of course, if you take it uh, to its, um, let's say, logical but absurd extreme, uh, these other uh, mythical heroes were not called Jesus, so of course there is nothing to see here, right? Uh, there are differences, therefore there are no similarities, or the similarities are not important. So again, uh, I was trying to come up with a way how to communicate it uh, better, and I came up with a game. It's going to be a quiz show, so you need to get a piece of paper, and you need you're going to be writing stuff down, right? So I will show you a bunch of quotes, and your job is to guess whether they are coming from early Christian authors or whether they are coming from a pagan author living roughly in the same time period, right? So let's say second century. Oh. 
century, second century plus or minus 200 years, give or take, right? So write a piece of paper, and as I will show, I will be showing you the various quotes. Your job is going to be uh, to write C for Christian, P for pagan, and that, or you can just wait for the response and just uh, write down how many hits you have and how many misses you have, right? So if you guess that correctly, um, you can add yourself one point, and if you guess that incorrectly, don't, you don't get a point, right? And let's see how many points you are going to have. And of course, the point of the quiz show is to show that it's very difficult very often to say whether it's a Christian talking or a pagan talking. And it drives the underlying point that there are these uh, parallels, right? Um, because if really the theological conceptions were fundamentally different, we wouldn't be able to find texts which would be difficult to uh, identify as either Christian or pagan, right? They just wouldn't be there. You, could, you would just read a quote and you would be immediately able to tell whether it's a Christian talking or a pagan talking, right? Because they are just so different. And the fact that there are instances where it's really difficult to say unless you know who's talking just shows that these similarities are there. And I just want to make two clarifying points before we start. So first of all, Nobody's saying, like no scholar, uh, I shouldn't make that strong great statement, right? Like no smart scholar is saying that there is a direct genetic link between like an extant Greco-Roman myth and, for example, the nativity story in the Gospel of Luke, let's say. So nobody's imagining that the author of the Gospel of Luke just had a copy of a pagan source in front of them and they wrote the nativity scene, just copying it, right? Or borrowing ideas. This is not the argument. Uh, the argument, uh, rather than a genetic one, is that there are were common uh, features of a cultural background common to both the authors of the canonical gospels and, for example, some Greco-Roman philosophers and Greco-Roman authors in general that shaped their ideas about similar topics in similar ways. So in a way, it's a much weaker argument. It's just an argument from a, a common cultural background, right? So, so like if someone today comes up with a new superhero and you notice that the superhero is similar to Batman, you don't have to postulate that there is a direct genetic link between the author of the new superhero and the author of Batman. You can just say that superheroes are now so prevalent in our culture then it's not implausible to imagine that someone just through osmosis, just through living in that kind of environment, would come up with a superhero that shares that similarity, right? And the second point I want to make before we start is just um, share with you my ideas for um, religion team TV shows. Uh, because at my dream, of course, and this is what my channel is gearing up towards, is to start my own uh, TV channel. Uh, which is going to be exclusively about uh, theology and philosophy of religion. And among other things, it's going to have TV shows, uh, quiz shows. And I've uh, so far came with three ideas for a quiz show. The first is about the Holy Trinity. And the setup of the show is this. Uh, we have participants and they each are placed in front of a jury of professional theologians. So it's basically an American Idol situation, right? So you have a participant, you have a competitor who is just placed on the spotlight in front of a panel of professional theologians. And the competition, the point of the competition is that the participant starts talking about the Trinity and he's disqualified as soon as he slips into one of the known identified heresies, right? It could be partialism, could be monarchism, could be modalism. Um, so I think that would be quite entertaining. And obviously the winner would be the person who manages to get out the most sentences before being condemned uh, by professional theologians as a heretic. Um, the only downside of that quiz show is that it would be very, very short, um, unfortunately. But I think we could fill like uh, maybe 10 minutes with airtime with... Uh, let's say, five different competitors. Um, the second idea, pretty straightforward, we'll just take Christian apologists and we will waterboard them uh, with their full consent, of course, and we'll just see whether they will be willing to give up their belief in the resurrection of Jesus. 
And I think if we find out consistently that Christian apologists who are waterboarded uh, either will or will not give up their belief in the resurrection, uh, we can draw all kinds of interesting uh, conclusions from that. It will certainly be a lot of new and interesting data uh, to form a background uh, for the argument f uh, from martyrdom, right? And the third idea is just this. Um, guess who's talking, right? So the first ever um, show um, of guess who's talking. So again, take a piece of paper and write down your tip for whether it's a, a pagan author talking or a Christian author talking, right? So let's start with something really, really simple. So I just, uh, I just uh, obviously obscured the names, and I made some small tweaks towards to the translation. So, for example, I capitalized all the instances of God and stuff like that in order to make it easier to uh, to basically basically make it more ambiguous, right? And the point is that the alterations that are made, uh, I made. Uh, either rule out you being able to tell which option is correct by like proper names and stuff like that. And also I made changes that are not noticeable in uh, the original languages, right? So for example, um, you have to make a decision whether you translate a particular wording as a god or the god, uh, but it's more ambivalent in the original languages, right? So here I think it's pretty straightforward. So Alkmene slash Mary, uh, thinking Joe or you know, Yahweh, the Christian God, was her husband, received him in her chamber. When he entered her room, she lied with him, thinking he was her husband. He laid with her with so much pleasure that he spent one day and doubled two nights. Uh, so I think here, so put your guests, guesses down. Is this a Christian story or is this a pagan story? Is this about Mary and God, uh, Yahweh? Or is this about Alcmene and uh, Jupiter or Zeus? Uh, well, I think in this case, it's very, very easy, but this is just a practice round, right? So write down your guesses and I will uh, show you the correct answer uh, momentarily. So three to one, here, here we go. So of course, this is a big story. Um, a very famous one, right? Uh, this particular retelling is relatively late, uh, from late antiquity. But yeah, it's the, the idea that when Heracles and Iphicles were conceived, um, because Alcmene was so beautiful, um, Jupiter or Zeus had so much fun that he actually extended, he ordered, I think, Helios, the god of the sun, um, that he basically extended the night so that it spanned three days because he was having so much fun. Uh, it's a pretty useful power to have, if you ask me. So I think uh, I'm sure you all got it correctly, right? So this was a bacon story. Uh, let's move to a different example. The Holy Spirit, uh, Pneuma in Greek, will come on you, and the power, Dynamis in Greek, of the Most High will ov overshadow you. So the Holy One uh, to be born will be called the Son of God. So again, Put down your guess, uh, guesses, whether this is a Christian uh, text or a Christian passage, Christian quote, or a pagan one. And he, again, here it's just for uh, practice, um, so you get the gist of what I'm trying to do, uh, because of course this is very easy to guess. Uh, that's from the Gospel of Luke, right? So here we have a clear example of how Christians are talking about conceiving a son of a god. and. Already you can see the massive differences, right? So in the pagan version, we have Zeus having so much fun with coitus that he actually makes the night three times longer than usual. And in the Christian version, we have no penetration, we have no sex, um, no sperma. We have just the Holy Spirit and power dynamis uh, overshadowing uh, Mary, right? So clearly two completely different theologies, no similarities whatsoever, right? Well, uh, not so fast, because now it's going to get a little bit more difficult. It's going to get a little bit more complicated. And now your task is guess who's your task is to guess who's talking. Now there should be like a jingle, right? Um, okay, uh, so let's move on. Uh, it was this witch when it came upon Alcmene on Mary, and overshadowed her, uh, caused her to conceive not by intercourse, but by power, dynamis. 
So here again, we have a quote which, which, which features this concept of power, dynamis. And the same word as uh, it was in the Gospel of Luke. Is this a Christian source or is it a pagan source? So write down your guesses and then give yourself a point if you guess it correctly or no point if you guess incorrectly. Uh, so I'll give you, uh, maybe reread the passage, I'll give you a little bit of time and three to one, here we go. So this is, of course, a Christian author. That's Justin Martyr, first apology. He's just summarizing basically the gospel, more specifically the gospel of Luke, right? So again, not difficult, not that difficult to guess. I'm sure most of you got it right. But maybe some of you were already tempted to put down P for pagan. So maybe there's already some people who lost. Um, so let's move on. God does not feel sexual attraction for a perishable body. So here we have some Pauline language, right? Perishable body, imperishable body. That's uh, straight out of 1 Corinthians, I think. So is this a pagan or a Christian speaking? Um, so write down C or P and then give yourself a point accordingly. Uh, three, two, one, here we go. So this is actually a pagan talking. Uh, so this is Celsus debunking uh, the Gospels or Christianity at large, right? In the sec uh, At the end of the second century. Uh, so already we start seeing a very educated, uh, well-versed in pagan philosophy author writing uh, contemporaneously with uh, the Christian authors, uh, exposing or um, communicating the idea that God, in this case it would be a pagan God, the God of the philosophers, uh, does not feel sexual attraction for a perishable body. This is, by the way, not him communicating the Christian position. This is him communicating what he sincerely believes, right? So um, I think the picture emerges. Let's go on. Uh, when we say that Uranos, or Logos, uh, who was the firstborn of God, was produced, uh, we say also that Uranos, Uranos uh, or Logos, uh, who was the firstborn of God, was produced without a sexual union. So, of course, Uranos was the first God who was uh, begotten in most versions of the Greek uh, the theogony, so the... Uh, creation of the gods, the generation of the gods, right? Um, so you have you, you usually start with a couple of gods that um, are not created, that exist uh, supposedly from eternity past. That's the idea, right? right? For example, in Hesiod, you have chaos, chaos, uh, chasm or void. You have Gaia, you have Eros, love, and you have Tartaros. And then uh, Gaia... Uh, on her own, uh, generates or gives birth uh, asexually without having a partner to Uranus um, heavens, right? And then they procreate and they, they have other generations of gods and they have children and stuff like that. But the point is, guess who's talking? Is this a early Christian or is it a pagan writing this? So place down C or P and um, let's see, uh, three, two, one. So this is again Justin Martyr, first apology. So he says that Logos, of course, the firstborn of God, was produced without sexual union. Um, so maybe some of you placed your bets on a Greek philosopher saying this, a Greek author saying that, like this, and you already lost a point, which didn't gain a point, but maybe you guessed it correctly. Uh, so let's let's move on. Another quote. It is very fit we should apply that to Plato slash Jesus. And then there's a quote. He seemed not sprung from mortal man, but God. But for my part, I am afraid to beget, as well as to be begotten, is repugnant to the incorruptibility of God. So I am afraid that to beget or to be begotten is repugnant to the incorruptibility of God. So again, here we have the author communicating the idea that it's really repugnant to think that uh, an incorruptible God uh, produced an offspring, right? That he actually begot someone, uh, whether it's Plato or, or Jesus. So is this a pagan philosopher talking or is this a Christian philosopher talking? Well, let's find out. Three, two, one. There we go. So this is actually Plutarch. 
um, in one of his uh, philosophical treatises that's collected under Attica or, or Moralia in Latin. Um, so yeah, here's basically communicating, communicating his skepticism that Plato was divinely conceived. Because actually very early on, and this is a great example of early legendary development in the ancient world, uh, there was this idea that Plato was begotten by a god, right? Um, as far as we know, it was already circulated by Speusippus, who was Plato's own nephew. Uh, he circulated the idea that Plato's father was actually Apollo. And the account is very similar to uh, the Gospel of Luke, uh, interestingly enough, right? So Ariston, who, is, uh, who was Plato's father, uh, wanted to have sex with Plato's mother, but actually Apollo appeared to him and warned him not to have sex with her for the period of 10 months. Uh, why 10 months? Well, because that's the duration of pregnancy. Uh, why is it 10 and not 9? Well, because Greek months were shorter, right? Greeks were using lunar calendar, so in the Greek calendar, pregnancy lasts for 10 months because the the, the duration of a month is a little bit short, right? And why is Apollo instructing Plato's father to do that, to abstain basically from sexual intercourse for a duration of a pregnancy? Well, because he's about to um, impregnate, either sexually or asexually, Plato's mother, and he wanted to make sure that everyone will know that this is actually his child and not the child of Ariston, right? Um, so, yeah, uh, Plutarch is basically uh, debunking it, and he's saying, look, um, incorruptible gods don't beget children, right? So let's move on. It is neither probable nor fitting that God is, as some philosophers say, mingled with matter, which is altogether passive, and with things which are subject to countless necessities, chances, and changes. So this isn't necessarily connected to sex, to coitus, but, uh, and by the way, if you're uh, playing the Pine Creek drinking game, then you're already pretty wasted, right? Uh, let's see how many live viewers I still have. How many dead viewers do I have? 19, wow, that's kind of a lot. Uh, okay, uh, so this is not necessarily about coitus, but uh, it's about this idea that it's not really probable or fitting um, for God uh, to be mingled with matter. Maybe this is talking about sex. I, I think I, I pulled it from a passage that's uh, talking about a divine uh, conception, either of Jesus or of someone else. Uh, and this is the mingling of matter, right? It's it's very, uh, like a kind of a physical idea. Um, and with things that are subject to countless necessities, changes, and chances, right? And matter, of course, is altogether passive. Uh, maybe we have a hint of Aristotelian slash slash related domestic philosophy here. So is this pagan or Christian? Place your bets. We haven't had a Christian for a while, so maybe this is Christian. What what do you guys think? Um, so again, this is Plutarch. Uh, this time a different uh, philosophical treatise, right? Um, so again, we have a pagan author, Greco-Roman author, coming from the same cultural background that produced, centuries later, of course, produced Homer, where gods are yeah, abducting people, raping them, uh, producing children, and uh, fighting, cussing each other out. And here we have a philosopher, a pagan philosopher, coming from the same tradition, saying, look, guys, this is nuts, right? Gods don't mingle with matter, which is altogether passive. Um, so, yeah. Let's move on. Uh, a different quote. I take courage when I hear Plato or Luke uh, himself say concerning the father and maker of the world and other born things, whom he calls the unborn and eternal God, that beings born of God do not come to be through seed, surely, but by another power, dynamis of God. So here we have some very Lucan language, right? Dynamis, the power. Uh, and the author is essentially saying, look, um, the things that are created, right? Uh, God is, of course, unborn and eternal. But the beings that are born of God, they are not born through seed. Uh, there's no sex. There's no semen involved, right? They are just um, born through power. Dynamis, right? Uh, same language used in the Gospel of Luke. 
So surely this must be a Christian author, right? So place your bets. I kind of gave that one for free because this is, of course, again, Plutarch talking. And um, yeah, again, um, it's through power. It's not through semen. And this is Plutarch talking, right? Okay, how is it the case if the conception, the nativity of Jesus is so completely different from these uh, Greco-Roman myths of, you know, Mithras and, um, oh, I guess Osiris is uh, Egyptian, right? Um, and Mithra is Persian. What, I'm, <laughs> what am I even talking about? Uh, Heracles, uh, there you go. Uh, so if the nativity of Jesus is so different from uh, the story of how, uh, you know, Heracles was conceived uh, through Alcmena and Zeus, how is it the case that we have a Plutarch, a pagan philosopher who says, look, um, the eternal and unborn God, uh, when a beings are born of him, it's not through semen, it's through power. Um, maybe there is some common cultural context, some common cultural background, right? That already human thought progressed to a point when people started to smirk on the idea that gods have intercourse. Um, so let's move on. Uh, a different quote. While a woman can be approached by a divine spirit, pneuma, and made pregnant, there is no such thing as internal, inter carnal intercourse and communion between a man and divinity. Surely this must be a Christian, right? So again, while a woman can be approached by a divine spirit, we could translate it as the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, that would be just pneuma, the same word, and made pregnant. Uh, there is no such thing as kernel inter and communion between a man and divinity. So, you know, these Greek myths where um, gods have just, just raped people, abduct people, men and women, and goddesses like Aphrodite, you know, rape men. Um, Aeneas, for example, was a son of Aphrodite uh, who had sex with uh, his father, uh, Anchises. Um, so surely this must be completely ludicrous, right? Because divinity, of course, there is no carnal intercourse. So place down your bets, C or P, three to one, go. So again, this is Plutarch. Uh, in this case, Life of Numa. So this is, of course, ancient Greco-Roman historical biography or bios. Uh, that's the same genre that the canonical gospels are written in, right? So that must be true because it's contained in the historical work, right? Uh, it's contained in the same genre of literature as, uh, for example, John 1.1, 1, 1, right? Uh, sh that must be true if it's his ancient history. Um, and if, if you throw this out, you would have to throw out all of ancient history, right? Um, so let's move on. I don't think I have that many left. Uh, I think I have, yeah, four more. Okay, let's go. Uh, that immortal God should take carnal pleasure in a mortal body and its beauty this surely is hard to believe. So again, basically the same idea. I would just be repeating myself. So Christian or pagan? C or P? If you get it right, give yourself a point. If you get it wrong, um, then no point. Uh, three to one. Again, Plutarch, Life of Numa. Um, sounds like a, a Christian apologist, right? A Christian, other Christian author. Uh, it wouldn't be uh, out of place in Tertullian or uh, Clement of Rome, right? Um, so why is it the case that it's a Greco-Roman philosopher uh, saying this? Um, it's really weird if there are no parallels. Okay, I think three more to go. I do not find it strange if it is uh, not by a physical approach, like a man's, but by another forms and through other forms of contact and touch that God alters mortal nature and makes it pregnant with a more divine offspring, right? So here we have an author saying, look, it's not uh, by physical approach, like man's. We all know what that means, right? We all had the, the bees and what's, what's that English idiom? The bees talk, the talk about bees, um, but through different forms, uh, through a different kind of contact or touch that God alters mortal nature and makes it pregnant, maybe through power, maybe there is some um, pneuma involved, right? 
Neo Mahagyu, uh, Holy Spirit. So is this a Christian talking or is it a pagan talking? Now C or P. Three, two, one, go. Uh, so again, this is blue dark. Um, same, uh, same underlying message. And uh, that's it. Um, so let me just catch up with the chat. And now I will actually count it and tell me how many you got wrong. So we have one, two, three, four. Uh, this is going to be faster. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. So twenty-two different quotes. How many points do you have? So twenty-two possible points. So the maximum for you to get. Oh, birds and bees. Thank you. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, so. 22 points was the maximum. How many points did you get? get? So, um, Roman Bezel only had six, which is not a lot. Uh, but actually, okay, Chris only uh, also had uh, six points. Um, and this is saying something, right? Like, the, I think it's expected that people are not going to score very much. If you actually score a lot, then kudos to you because you are an excellent classicist. You are able to tell um, either through uh, like, no, like extensive familiarity with ancient literature or through some sixth sense um, which, exact, which exact author is writing. Right? Uh, converse content, I got four wrong. Okay, cool. And I guess since uh, they were overwhelmingly pagan, and this was, of course, uh, by design, right? Like I, I ended up, I started with some Christians in order to uh, prime you into thinking that maybe it's going to be 50-50 and you will more likely guess that this is a Christian talking while in fact it's a pagan talking because that's what I want you to realize, right? That these pagan guys are actually something like Christians. This is like a heuristic to make you realize that and appreciate it, right? Um, yeah. There is, of course, question of timing, right? So uh, a lot of these guys were, for, uh, a lot of the quotes were from Plutarch, who is, you know, early second century, uh, late first, early second century. I think he died after like 120 uh, at some point. Uh, I think the last datable thing that he says is like 119. So he died probably short, shortly after that, uh, which means he's contemporary with the author of the Gospel of Luke, right? Like they would meet. Um, they were probably writing at the same time, maybe even in the same year, uh, which I, I'm, of course, um, alluding to and making fun of uh, the idea that uh, the author of the Gospel of Luke and Acts actually uh, lived in the uh, early second century and wrote in the early second century. So, yeah, uh, any more participants? How many points did you get? I wonder how many points I would score. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I, I'm not that familiar with early Christian literature, so maybe I would guess like more Christians than there actually were. Um, okay. And the there's there was actually a specific piece of research that gave me idea for this um, this kind of quiz show, right? And it was written by David Litva, who has a PhD from University of Virginia, and he's teaching at the Australian Catholic University. And he wrote a book which is called Jesus Deus, the early Christian depiction of Jesus as a, Medi as a Mediterranean god. Um, so already you have essentially the entire book uh, pointing out some of the similarities. He's not necessarily arguing that um, and he's actually, actually explicitly denying that you know early Christians just copied Mediterranean deities. He's essentially saying that look, the way how Jesus is being depicted in early Christian literature, not only in the canon of the New Testament, but also in other writings, for example, in the writings of Justin Mather that we've seen in some of those passages, is uh, really similar uh, to how 
Mediterranean Greco-Roman gods are depicted, right? And what's the best explanation for that kind of similarity? Well, it's this common cultural background, right? Uh, these early Christian authors, whether they were the authors of the New Testament or the subsequent Christian authors, uh, they were just people, right? And it's just completely plausible that they just draw from the same kind of cultural stimuli. Uh, they maybe received a very similar education. And in fact, we do know for a fact that a lot of the early Christian authors like Tertullian or just their mother actually received excellent education, pagan education, right? So they were intimately familiar with all of the myths. They were familiar with Hellenistic philosophy. They were very familiar with way of argumentation, with familiar with rhetoric. So it's just natural that this kind of cultural background will seep through their head and colored and shape their theology. Completely normal if someone suggested it about any other deity, then uh, people would obviously accept it, right? And people, of course, do accept it uh, when it comes to you know any other deity except their own. Um, my favorite example is Manichaeism. So Mani was a prophet who lived in the third century in uh, Persia, in the Sassanid Empire. And he uh, basically came up with a, a new religious system and he was martyred for his belief. And he was given the opportunity to recant, of course, but we have historical accounts of how he, before he died, actually comforted his own disciples, telling them not to worry about his impending martyrdom. So really, was Mani mischievous? Was he a manic? Or was he the Messiah, right? Because one of the things that he supposedly claimed is that he's resurrected, uh, reincarnated Jesus, right? Uh, and of course, everyone, I guess, except Manichaeans, recognize that his religious system is a blend of some ideas from Eastern religion, for example, reincarnation, and some ideas from Christianity. For example, there being a Messiah and Jesus being one, right? As far as I know, Mani is the first person that we have on record claiming that he's actually Jesus reincarnated, uh, born again, right? This, this idea of metempsychosis, uh, reincarnation of souls to different bodies, which was really common not only in the Eastern world, where I guess people, that's the region where people associated with today, but it was actually really common in uh, Greek thought, uh, particularly the idea that uh, souls move from body to body. Uh, so yeah, like everyone of this recognizes that like re his religious system is just a product of syncretization, right? Um, but, you know, if there was a Manichaean apologist, he would say, look, uh, it's obviously different, right? And it would be completely implausible for a Christian to come up with the idea of reincarnation uh, because reincarnation is just not a thing in Christian worldview, right? In Christian theology. And it would be completely uh, unthinkable for a person of Eastern theological and philosophical persuasion to come up with the idea that there is a Messiah and that Jesus is the Messiah, right? That was uh, exclusively Jewish and then uh, Christian conception. So clearly, this can't be a product of syncretism. It must be metaphysically, ontologically true, right? Nobody would come up with that. Nobody would synthesize these two completely uh, different uh, ideas from two completely different religions, right? Uh, but the point is that only people who are already entrenched in that worldview think about these things that way to outsiders. It's just pretty obvious that the most probable explanation is this uh, for how the theology formed is this just a product of this shared cultural background, right? And yeah, I mean, uh, this is what we see, I think, in Jesus' nativity as well. Uh, and what's, uh, so let's, let's actually showcase some quotes from his book, right? Um, and just to reiterate it, this is what Litva says himself. Uh, the idea is not that the author of Luke borrowed from the stories of Perseus, Heracles, or Minos to present his idea of divine conception. Stories of divine conception were cultural common coin in the ancient Mediterranean world and could be imagined in philosophically and theologically sophisticated ways. 
right? So he's essentially saying, look, I don't think that the authors of the Gospels were stealing from Mediterranean religions, right? Uh, it was just uh, the society that they lived in. So it's not surprising that their theology would be colored by it, right? And he's also pointing out that if you are thinking about divine conception, uh, you don't have to think about sperm, right? You don't have to think about Zeus having such a good time sexually that he needs to make the night three times longer. You can just, uh, you can also talk about it in a very philosophically and theologically sophisticated ways, ways that can uh, be harmonized with your very high view of God being eternal, unchanging, and not being mingled with matter and stuff like that, not having any passions, uh, not, not being... Uh, enticed with lust and stuff like that. And then he goes on to say, after going through some of the passages that I also highlighted, Plutarch's explanation of divine conception is a carefully worded and sophisticated account of how it can occur without saying anything unpure or unworthy of God. For example, uh, that he changes from form or suffers passion. Plutarch, an educated member of a literary elite, is clearly uncomfortable with grassy, anthropomorphized gods having sex with mortal women. For him, such stories were not theologically correct and thus not credible. Speaking of divine conception in terms of pneuma, or pneuma, was a philosophically respectable, because non, because non sexual, way of relating the mystery of divine conception in the late first century CE. So here Litva gives uh, a dating for. The century, so that would be contemporary with the Gospel of, of Luke, right? Uh, even if you are a boomer and you think that the Gospel of Luke was actually written in like 80s, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, um, so there you go, right? So if you are, let's say, a Christian apologist, you happen to be a Christian apologist and you happen to be watching it, uh, you can, you can of course, talk about how Jesus is different and how there, how, how about how there is no other. Mediterranean ancient deity that's called Jesus. But what you shouldn't be saying is that pagans imagined divine conception in a sexual way, uh, but Christians didn't. That's not a difference, right? There were at least some pagans, for example Plato, who are contemporary with the gospel authors, who imagined um, divine conception in a very different way. Why? Because they had a specific view of the God. Not the gods, but the god, the one god of the philosophers, right? Which, of course, precedes Christianity, the idea. Um, and not just, like, one idea, but the whole package deal of God being this uh, timeless, spaceless, immaterial, changeless being um, just flows from Greek theology. Um, and one last quote. Furthermore, to speak of divine conception through power, dynamis, carries a ring of theological respectability. Power, so dynamis, is a basic trait of divinity in the Mediterranean world. Ex it expresses the reality and activity of God in the world, even if the deity in mind far transcends common human modes of conception. As a vague term, moreover, power, again dynamis, is a safe way to speak about a god's non-anthropomorphic interactions with a human female. In sum, both Luke and Plutarch effectively speak of divine pneuma as power and power as the efficient cause of pregnancy without hinting at perceived theologically crass features such as metamorphosis into a male body, penetration by divine penis, or the ejaculation of divine seed into the womb. Okay, so that's it. Um, and what's really interesting and what I love about... Uh, Litva is that he actually, and this is something that I didn't know uh, before I read his book, he actually points out that in later Christian texts, uh, the conception of Jesus is actually depicted in much more sexually explicit ways, right? So, yeah, the author of the Gospel of Luke was obviously very sophisticated. He was very well in tune with the philosophical discourse of the late first or early second century. Uh, so he was able to depict 
um, the conception in a way that would not be offensive to the theological ideas that he shared with someone like Blue Dark, but later Christian authors were just perverts, you know, like um, there uh, the conception is much, much more similar to the Greco-Roman divine conception myth, right? Uh, so, for example, we can uh, find passages uh, in early Christian literature where Logos actually enters uh, Mary's womb, um, or there are conceptions where and passages where an angel actually enters Mary, right? Um, or Christ even enters Mary in a form of an angel, right? So uh, we have like Jesus basically being his own father, which he is even on uh, the view of the Gospel of Luke, right? The Trinity. In the fourth century, uh, there was even a text in which Mary. Uh, conceived Jesus through her ear, uh, right? Because you need to have her being uh, conceived. Uh, you, you need to have Jesus being conceived. Somehow, it can't be through her uterus, so it needs to be through some different orifice. So it's through uh, an ear, right? So if you are, you know, having a wild sex, then be very careful because apparently you can get pregnant by that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, which brings me to something that I wanted to show you guys, but I'm sure most of you already know this. Uh, there is this hilarious uh, Mormon uh, cartoon. And as far as I understand it, it's this is not a parody. This was actually put out by the LDS Church, like officially. And again, I'm not an expert on Mormonism, so what I'm saying right now might be complete bullshit, right? But as far as I understand it, this is like a real deal. This was actually produced by Mormons, for Mormons. And yeah, I just love it because of the way how um, Jesus' conception, uh, more specifically what immediately precedes that, is depicted. Um, I, someone should definitely splice that with like 70s porn music. Uh, because of course, as, as some of you may know, um, at least as far as I can tell in Mormonism, yeah, it's, it's much more explicit, right? Like Yahweh has a human body, he has a human form, and there is actual sexual intercourse. So let me try to play that. Uh, hopefully you will be able to hear it. Uh, this is uh, more than anything me trying to test if I can actually uh, play videos on the stream. That Elohim and one of his goddess wives came to earth as Adam and Eve to start the human race. Thousands of years later, Elohim in human form once, form once again journeyed to Earth from the starbase Kolob, this time to have sex with the Virgin Mary in order to provide Jesus with a physical body. <laughs> yeah, I just love, love the look on, on his face, right? He knows what's what, right? <laughs> you can't say no to that face. Come on. If you imagine you're a virgin, uh, you are betrothed. So I, I think in some in some early Christian traditions, Mary was very very young when she was betrothed. I think she was like twelve. Maybe I'm mistaking it with Aisha in, in Islam, but I think it's the case that she was actually very very young. But uh, like normal people <laughs> who would probably imagine that she's maybe you know eighteen nineteen. Uh, of course, at, at an age where she can give sexual consent. Uh, so yeah, imagine you are a virgin in the middle of nowhere in, in Palestine, either in Bethlehem or in Nazareth, depending on which gospel you read. Someone knocks on your door and there is this, this piece of meat <laughs> behind the door. Um, how, how can you say no, no to that, right? Uh, so yeah, uh, by the way, let me know in the chat if you could hear the audio, that would be great. Sound works? Okay, awesome. So yeah, that was just what I wanted to talk about. Maybe I should a little bit, maybe talk a little bit more about, okay, we have this idea that, like in the past, when Homer was around, the idea that the gods have actual sex, actual physical intercourse, was obviously non-problematic. At least it was not as problematic for Homer as it was later for Plutarch. Because if it was problematic for Homer, then it would not be depicted, right? 
I think that's a very reasonable argument to make. Uh, so clearly, something must have changed in the couple of centuries before when Homer was around and when Plutarch was around. So what really changed? Why was it the case that people suddenly started considering the idea that gods have sex and more generally that gods are violent and that they um, are in discord with each other and that they are fighting and that they are bleeding even in, um, for example, in the Iliad, gods are actually injured. Uh, Aphrodite, for example, Aphrodite uh, is injured and she bleeds Ictor, the divine blood. Um, so, so why is it the case that this was okay for someone like Homer to depict, but a couple of centuries later, this wasn't okay for Plutarch? Well, I think if you are thinking about why is it the case that some norms in normative ethics, applied ethics, and maybe even in meta-ethics changed, I think the reason is usually the change in material conditions. This is what is typically uh, behind it, right? So if you understand changes in material conditions, you will understand changes in human behavior and also changes in how people think about different things, how they conceptualize th things, right? And you, we can see it very, uh, very well in how in the uh, Greek Dark Ages, in the Dark Centuries, at early uh, Iron Age, uh, how, for example, thieving was conceived, right? So in this kind of society, thieving was not really considered to be immoral. We, you had different communities, you have different tribes, different villages, different towns that were centered, that were centered, centered around an aristocracy headed by a king. And they occupied different regions in Greece and the various surrounding areas, right? And they would very in frequently engage essentially in raids against their neighbors, who were usually also Greeks. And the point of the raiding was to uh, steal their flock, right? Because the most important wealth uh, was, uh, and something that was like movable that you could actually steal, right? Was the flock. So their sheep, their goats, their bovine animals and stuff like that. Uh, so this was happening all the time. Um, so people were just stealing each other uh, animals. And people might be killed, um, or it could just be a heist. And you know nobody knows about it, nobody's injured, people only find out about it later. This was just completely normal way how people lived, how, how people uh, operated. And it wasn't really considered immoral. Uh, it was even considered brave and courageous uh, to organize it, and to get away with it. If you were able to do it successfully, that counting towards you being a proper male in kind of the gender roles of that society. Right? But of course, later, the situation changed, and it became no longer socially and morally acceptable to engage in this kind of behavior. Piracy, for example, was considered, became immoral. Um, I know Th Thucydides, for example, says in his first book when he's talking about a more distant uh, history in uh, that there are still some islands in um, his own time, but it's customary for people. The way how people greet is by asking each other whether they are pirates, right? It's just it was by, by then it was just an idiom, right? It was just a formalized, um, stale. Um, saying like a pity utterance that you would say so if you, when you meet a person you greet him by asking are you a pirate and the reason why it's still a custom it was still a custom by Thucydides's own time is because yeah like there was a lot of piracy going on right uh, so people would wonder that and uh, some of the people occupying living in those islands would be pirates a couple of centuries ago and that would just be a normal profession. Uh, they would, for example, not only take animals, they would even capture people and they would sell them to slavery. And that, was, that wasn't considered uh, problematic, right? It was a spoil of war. It was something that you took from a successful raid. And yeah, you just uh, sell your property as you would sell anything else. Women were, of course, considered property also, right? Um, in the Iliad, uh, women are used as a measure of value 
they are compared against again uh, animals right so you would say that a female uh, servant is worth a certain number of cows or bulls um, so non problematic but of course in Later centuries, the conception of morality changed. And the question is, what changed? Well, what changed was material conditions, right? Um, society became more advanced, technology advanced, and people started gathering in large cities. So certain social norms and certain mores that are more conducive to a different organization of society became promoted because they were necessary for the society to function. So if you have large cities where anonymous um, you know, groups of people, people who don't know each other, people who are not sharing a common uh, recent ancestor, right? So who are not part of the same family, they are not tracing the same lineage in their genealogies, are living together. When people engage in international trade, which is, of course, beneficial for everyone, uh, when you have this kind of society, well, then thieving is, of course, no longer going to be morally acceptable, right? Um, you might not even need it. Like the reason why thieving was common in early Iron Age Greece and why it was not considered morally problematic is because the living conditions were just so atrocious and most people were just living on basic subsistence that the external conditions just forced people to steal, right? Because they needed to feed their families, you know? Uh, their children would starve. So, of course, people would look for ways how to rationalize it, how to justify it. And they would come up with an ethical system, with a value system, that would not problematize this kind of behavior. There were, of course, other things that were problematic. Like murder was wrong, right? If you, especially if you murdered someone in a group, of, of, in your own kind, then you became unpure and you had to be purified. But not thieving. Uh, and centuries later, when the material conditions of the society changed, the more is changed as well. So I think this is uh, ultimately, fundamentally, why the conception of the gods changed as well. Why it was no longer um, plausible for people to imagine that gods are at discord and that they have lusts and passions and that they are stealing women you know, uh, from each other and from mortal men. Um, you can, of course, say, okay, this is because of developments in Greek, uh, abstract thought in Greek philosophy and stuff and stuff like that. But that just pushes the explanation down the road. You still need to explain why is it the case that these advancements, these changes in the way how people thought about the gods were made. And I think the successful explanation is the change in material conditions. Okay, cool. So... Uh, what else do I want to talk about? Yeah, on the last stream, I was talking about a feud between Mike Lacona and um, Lydia McGrew about uh, basically harmonization versus uh, literary devices. And I mentioned an exchange in a YouTube comment section, which I didn't pre prepare. I like didn't look up the relevant passages. And I kind of felt bad about it because I didn't want to, I wanted to make sure that I don't represent, misrepresent the people. So I just uh, look it up and here you go. I will put the link to that in the description as well as uh, a link to the book by David Litwa that I mentioned. Um, I thought it was the comments. Uh, I thought that the comments were under a video on Pike Creek Duck's channel um, where I talked to uh, Blake Junta, but it actually turns out that the comments are under a video put out by Mike Lacona, where Mike Lacona actually addresses the criticism levied against him by Lydia McGrew. Uh, so I was mistaken about that, which just shows you that you can't trust oral tradition, right? <laughs> uh, so even in a society where we have nearly universal literacy and everyone can just fact check information all the time, apparently, you can make these kinds of uh, mistakes and false information gets propagated. Uh, so you should lower your uh, confidence in uh, other claims appropriately. Uh, so I just asked Mike Lacona a very simple question. Um, are you just going to harmonize when it comes to the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus? Or are literary tropes and literary devices that you use to explain away apparent contradiction in the Gospels also on the table. Because my suspicion is that Mike Lacona is perfectly okay 
to explain away gospel differences as gospel authors using ancient literary devices when it comes to unimportant stuff, like uh, the, the healing of Sergeant's servant. Really mundane, no theology hangs on that. But when it comes to the resurrection, I suspect that Mike Lacuna becomes Lydia McGrew. So suddenly, there's no difference between them. Because this is really important. Even Mike Lacuna, even though he's super willing to admit there is a lot of narrative flexibility in the Gospels, is going to start sounding like Lydia McGrew when it comes to post-resurrection appearances, and he will start harmonizing them. Why? Well, because if you harmonize them, then you are making sure that all of them are still on the table when it comes to explaining the text, right? You can't say, okay, this appearance of Jesus was made up. It didn't actually happen. It's a product of a gospel author using a ancient literary trope, an ancient literary device. Uh, because if you, of course, start saying that, then yeah, that's a slippery slope. But also, uh, even Mike Lacona and all apologists need to get as many of these details on the table when it comes to explaining the text uh, in order to uh, for the resurrection hypothesis to stay uh, in the game, right? Because they, for example, need there to be people who were sincerely convinced that they are seeing Jesus eating a piece of fish, right? Uh, they need that to be the case, that if you could take a time machine and travel back in the first century, we would be able to find people that we could ask, and they would be able to truthfully say, yeah, I believe I saw Jesus, resurrected Jesus, eating a piece of fish. Because if it's the case that the reason why the narrative of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances involves Jesus eating a piece of fish is, in fact, uh, that it was made up by a gospel author, that it's a product of this narrative flexibility, then suddenly the text becomes very, very easy to explain, right? If you don't actually have those people in history, uh, if Jesus eating a piece of fish, if Jesus having a breakfast with seven disciples by the Sea of Galilee are just scenes that were created by the gospel authors who were employing these literary devices, then alternative explanations of the evidence become super, super plausible. The plausibility goes way up, right? Uh, and I agree, if it is the case that there really were a people uh, who we could interview who sincerely believe that they experienced Jesus teaching them for 40 days, you can't explain that on hallucination hypothesis. You can't explain that with post-bereavement hallucination. Nobody be post-bereavement um, hallucinates their dead loved one being around and teaching them for 40 days, right? Uh, well, yeah, that would be a really bad explanation. But if the reason why the text says that there were people who were taught by the resurrected Jesus for 40 days is because the gospel authors were employing these ancient literary uh, devices and they were employing um, literary flexibility, then suddenly it becomes super easy to explain where the resurrection belief came from. So this is what I ask, basically, Mike Lacona. I ask, are there any elements of the post-resurrection appearances, narrat uh, appearance narratives, which you think are more probably than not a product of an ancient fictionalizing literary device and therefore not historical? And by the way, if you ever talk to Christian apologists, this is how you need to word it. Because you have to ask about pr probability, first of all. You need to ask about whether it's more probable than not. Because Mike Lacona is going to squirm like a worm and he is going to avoid actually committing to a probability assessment. He's going to say it's possible, but he's never going to say that this is more probable than not, because he would be fired again, I think. Uh, his, his career would be in trouble, uh, as, uh, of course, would his faith. Um, so he will always talk about possibility, but you have to go for probability. Or should we harmonize these narratives into one? Or in other words, when it comes to resurrection appearances, should I go with Mike Lacona or should I go with Lydia McGrew? Because I think when it comes to the resurrection, which is the, the important stuff, the mere Christianity stuff, Mike Lacona turns into Lydia McGrew. For example, do you think it's more probable than not that Jesus is a piece of fish and allowed Thomas to touch his wound and appeared to more than 500 brethren at the same time and appeared to his disciples uh, in Galilee 
on a mountain and appeared to seven disciples by the sea. And again, if you are ever talking to a Christian apologist, you need to word it like this because you need to make it a conjunction, right? So I'm not asking about these claims individually one by one. I'm asking about how probable it is that they are all true, all of them at every single time, right? So if you're playing poker, I'm not asking you about whether you draw a red king. I'm asking you whether you draw a royal flush, which has a red king in it. I think I'm not a poker player. I'm not even sure what's the terminology in English. But anyway, I'm not asking you about the individual cards that make up the royal flush. I'm asking you, did you draw a royal flush? The whole thing, right? Um, yeah, because Mike Lacona, if he says, um, yes, it's more probable than not, that all of those things happened at the same time. He's Lydia McGrew, right? And of course, uh, if he knows his probability theory, he knows that if he allows for a small probability that uh, each of the for each of these individual claims that they actually didn't happen in history, well, if you have this kind of uh, conjunction, then that probability adds up, right? Uh, so the package deal, like all of those claims, all together at the same time being true, um, the probability gets down. Um, or do you think it's more probable than not that at least one of these elements is not historical because they are a product of a fictionalizing literary device? And that's why, that's what best explains them only being narrated in one source and not any of the others. So again, I'm just asking, look, is it we have these source, we have these uh, elements of the gospel accounts in just one gospel usually, and not in any of the others. Uh, why is it the case? Um, isn't the best explanation that at least some of them are a product of the author's authorial inten invention, right? Um, if it's a former, I don't understand what the disagreement is between you and Lydia McGrew. It seems to me that you are both engaging in standard additive harmonization. Well, there you go. I'm just pointing out that, look, if you are just going to say all of it is true, all of the appearances are true, all of them happened in history, none of them uh, are a product of um, literary invention by the gospel authors, well, then what's what's the point of talking about it, right? This is the important stuff, right? This is the, the prize. This is the big deal. If this is false, then you're still in sin um, and your, false is in, uh, in, your, your uh, faith is in vain, right? So if you are just going to go back to harmonization on this, then what's what's even the point? And of course, Mike Lacona never responded. I actually uh, asked him multiple times under multiple videos, uh, basically a variation of the same question, and he never responded to any of it. Um, as far as I can remember, again, uh, oral tradition might be uh, unreliable here. But Blake Giunta very happily uh, jumped to bullet and responded, and he said a bunch of stuff. He says, among the list, among the things you list as potential expansions. Okay, uh, so uh, let's let's start at the beginning. So he, uh, I think Blake uh, Giunta, Giunta, understands what I'm doing, and he understands where this is going. Uh, he understands that Mike Lacona basically opened this Pandora box, and he let all of those. Uh, this narrative flexibility and this uh, literary devices out. And uh, once you let them out, you can't put them back in, right? They are just here for stay. He cannot unwrite his books and he cannot delete all of his videos and like destroy all the manuscripts. There's just too many of them. So yeah, uh, he, allowed, he introduced this concept of narrative flexibility into the discussion about the resurrection. Uh, so Blake Junta realizes that this is a slippery slope, and he wants to basically control the damage by saying, look, it's only this specific set of very well-defined, very precise literary tropes and devices that were a thing in the ancient world. There was a toolbox that contained very specific tools. And if you are suggesting that there was a creative narrative flexibility which doesn't fit any of the tools, then your hypothesis is just super implausible, super improbable. This is essentially what he's saying. Like Every time you propose that an element in the Gospels is a product of original 
uh, authorial creation of the gospel authors, it needs to fit this laundry list of predefined, uh, well-articulated um, literary devices, right? Uh, I, of course, think this is bullshit. I outlined the reason in the previous streams. I don't think that um, they're really... The, the ancient authors, I don't think the ancient authors thought about it like that. I don't think they had a bullet point list of like specific, well-defined uh, literary devices. I think it was much more fluid and flexible than that. But he's basically trying to uh, minimize the damage, and he's trying to push this whole thing into the box. He's trying to say, okay, if you are supposed to, if you are proposing it, it better be very well defined, uh, very well, very specific. It, it needs to hit one of these points on the list. And he says, one of these is expansion, right? So he basically says these uh, devices is transferal, displacement, conflation, completion, spotlight link, simplification, expression of narrative, expansion of the narrative details. Expansion of narrative details is making stuff up. So you add something that uh, you don't know for sure, for a fact, uh, happened, uh, but you are just an ancient author writing. You're trying to... Uh, come up with a story that communicates important messages. You are trying to create a plausible scene based on what you already believe and what your sources tell you. So you just add details. Among the And this is the important part. Among the list, uh, among the things you list as potential explanations, only the eating of fish and only in Luke strikes me as a prima facie fitting with the permissible range of expansion of narratic details. Again, permissible range this is Blake trying to put the uh, ghost back in the box. He's trying to minimize the damage. This is there is a permissible range, and what permissible range, and suggested that various elements of the resurrection narratives are outside the permissible range, uh, because of course what is outside permissible range is the conclusion that Jesus actually wasn't raised, right? Uh, so you have to stay in this permissible range because want that reach that conclusion, do we? Um, uh, so this is what he says. And Michael Akona still doesn't respond to it. But then suddenly Lydia McGrew shows up and she starts explaining how this is, these are not just incidental details. If you actually start thinking about what the consequences would be of the gospel authors employing even the level of narrative flexibility that Michael Akona is suggesting, the you would have to conclude that they just made up all kinds of stuff, right? It's it's like a house of cards or a domino. Michael Akona can say all he all day long that the changes are only in a very small permissible range, and that at best the gospel authors picked some details. But Lydia McGrew, I think, very correctly points out that if you actually think of the implications, the whole thing falls apart, right? Because there are things that follow from these small details being invented. Uh, so for example, he mentions that um, relocation of the appearance uh, of Jesus to Mary Magdalene, right? Um, so he just says, okay, uh, the author relocated the appearance. Um, but the problem is that it would actually result in quite a large change. She says, for example, there would be no occasion for her to offer to rebury the body and the entire terms of the dialogue done in, told in John would make no sense. Um, so yeah, there you go, right? Like even if you admit that there was this small tweaking, small uh, limited usage of these literary devices, like relocating appearance, what follows from that is actually quite a lot of material being invented. Like my favorite example is if you think that the author of the Gospel of John just changed the day of Jesus's crucifixion for theological reasons, which is what, for example, uh, Craig Evans believe, I think, uh, believes, I think this is what Rand Rousel believes, even though he's not a historian, right? Um, well, if that has massive implications, uh, there are elements of the story in the Gospel of John that were invented as well. And for example, the uh, uh, the Sanhedrin member, uh, council members don't want to enter Pilate's palace because don't, they don't want to be ritually defiled before the Passover lamb is being eaten, before the Passover meal, right? They want to stay ritually clean uh, for the Passover meal. 
But the problem is that if the author of the Gospel of John relocated uh, the change the day of the uh, crucifixion, well then, in reality, in actual history, the Passover meal was already eaten, so the Sanhedrin member council council members could not have been hesitant to enter uh, Pilate's palace, for at least for that reason, if at all, right? Uh, so these are like ripple effects that go through through these small changes. But what's super spicy is that um, she says. So, in fact, Lacona's view actually does lead him to apply his compositional devices rather wildly, as opposed to harmonization of resurrection accounts. Yeah, so she's saying, look, you can't keep the ghost in the box. Uh, as soon as you open it, it's out, um, because other things follow from it as well. And then she kind of turns against uh, Blake Gunther and says, he never, that I'm aware of or can recall, suggests that eating fish was an added detail in Luke, but I, did, I find it very interesting that you, capitalized, have spontaneously suggested here that according to his devices, this might have been an invented detail. So this is a moment that I have to admit sent like chills down my spine because I imagined Lydia McGrew being an inquisitor, um, basically branding uh, Blake Junta for um, being burned at the stake for also being a heretic, right? He sa she says, okay, Mike Lacona never su suggested that this is important, uh, this is in the detail, but isn't it interesting that you were willing to suggest it? And I, I think, uh, joking aside, he she makes a really good point. She actually um, demonstrated the danger for Christian apologetics, right? Like, if as soon as you let this thing out as soon as, soon as you open this Pandora box just gets out of control. You have perfectly good conservative evangelical Christian apologists like Blake Kunta suddenly running wild and going even beyond what Mike Lacona suggested. They will they themselves will start seeing um, literary devices in other things that Mike Lacona never suggested. Um, Mike Lacona never said that Jesus eating a piece of fish was an invented detail. But like Kyunda was perfectly happy to entertain that idea. And this is the damage. I think more and more people are going to, as uh, more and more people internalize that idea, um, the more the more and more plausible it is going to be that some of the details of these resurrection appearances were actually invented by the gospel authors. That doesn't, of course, mean that the gospel authors invented the, the resurrection, right? That doesn't mean that they didn't believe that Jesus was raised. They, of course, did believe that Jesus was raised. That's why they wrote that Jesus was raised, right? And they wrote that Jesus was raised bodily and that his body was missing from where it was buried because this is what they honestly believed. They believed in physical resurrections, not spiritual resurrections, right? Um, but as soon as you get those details off the table, as long as you can explain away Jesus eating a piece of fish and entire groups of people having an experience of him teaching them for 40 days uh, as products of literary flexibility, as products of gospel authors creating a scene. Well then, alternative explanations of the resurrection suddenly become much, much more probable. Uh, which alternative explanations? For example, my explanation which if you just go through a backlog of my videos, especially my guest appearances on various uh, channels, um, I articulated there very uh, succinctly, very elegantly. I had a debate with Kyle, uh, an apologist. Uh, definitely recommend that one, uh, because there I not only articulate my alternative explanation, but you will actually see me interact with someone who uh, raises objections. Uh, so this is what I wanted to talk about. Uh, some spicy comments. I think we might trigger the converse contender. Um, I think we, the two of us, should definitely have a con conversation at that point. Um, cool. Uh, so now uh, for something completely different. I want to talk about um, pseudosmerdis. 
Sudas Merdis was a guy, and by the way, for people who are new here, this is the uh, last segment in the stream where I just completely switch the gears and I start geeking about ancient history. It's The topic is completely unrelated to what I've been talking about for the past hour and a half. It's just something uh, super cool, usually something funny. In this case, I think it's hilarious uh, that I came across reading like primary sources and stuff. And I hope you guys will uh, enjoy it as well. So who was Pseudosmerdis? Uh, Pseudosmerdis, uh, um, allegedly, apparently, was a guy who ruled Persia for a, a period of time. He was an imposter who pretended to be a guy named Smerdis, who was next in line in the Persian throat, throne. So there was a Persian king named Cambyses who died. He had a brother, Smerdis. Uh, but this Smerdis, this guy was actually, his brother was actually dead already. But apparently there was a mage, so a member of the Magi, the priestly caste uh, in the Persian Empire. Uh, that would be the same Magi that show up in the Gospel of Matthew in the... Uh, there's a segue in the uh, nativity narrative, right? So he was a mage who just happened to apparently look uh, like Smerdis, the dead guy, right? So bas he basically managed to seize the throne for himself. He pretended to be someone who he wasn't, and therefore history gave us this amazing name, Pseudo Smerdis. Um, and this was actually kind of common in antiquity. Like, it's super weird today. Like, imagine today someone pretended to be Donald Trump, and he actually managed to get into the White House and be president while, like, real Donald Trump was dead, right? I'm not sure that would fly. But th that was actually surprisingly common in antiquity. And it, we have various uh, instances of pretendants um, posing as specific historical figures, usually title claimants, um, and ruling uh, people in their place. Uh, and I'm sure we will get to talk about more examples like the, this in the future. Um, if you ask me how that's possible, I'm not even sure. I'm sure there were like no photographs, of course, there was no internet, so people very often didn't even know how their kings looked like. Uh, usually the only way I could find out was on coinage. Uh, but yeah, um, it wasn't that, that easy, so I guess that explains it. Uh, but of course, the Smerdis was eventually exposed. How he was exposed? Well, there were some people who were wondering why is it the case that he's not leaving the castle and he's not like um, accepting uh, delegations and stuff like that. He was basically trying to isolate himself from the rest of the, the empire, which, if you are an imposter, kind of makes sense. Uh, so one of those people who were suspicious actually instructed one of the concubines of this new king to check during coitus, there's another segue, whether this new king has ears or not. Because it was known that this Magi, who I guess people knew kind of looks like Smerdis, uh, had his ears cut off previously. A form of a punishment, right? It just cut your ears off. But the thing is that Persians actually wore long hair, so you couldn't even tell very easily whether someone has ears or not. If you know uh, Star Trek, that's the thing with Klingons, right? In Star Trek Next Generation, you never see Worf's ears because he has them covered with long hair. Same situation. But there was someone specif specifically who could check whether the king has ears or not. His concubine, right? Because his concubine, in the heat of the moment, you have to, uh, you have to imagine Daenerys and Drogo in... Uh, early seasons of the Game of Thrones, could just like gently touch his head and she could feel whether he has ears or not. And lo and behold, he didn't. So he was exposed as a pretender. He was deposed. And, but then there was a problem because with Cambyses' death and Smerdis' death, uh, the royal dynasty actually died out. So people had to elect a new king. And they, of course, went about it the stupidest way possible. More specifically, there were seven nobles who were involved in uncovering the deception. They were the core of the conspiracy and who deposed Pseudosmerdis. And they couldn't agree what form of government they should have. So in Herodotus, there is this 
beautiful passage where the historical narrative, I would say historical narrative, breaks, and Herodotus just inserts this um, this political discourse about um, different forms of government. Uh, so suddenly, Darius and different like Persian nobles break into speeches being political scientists and like discussing different merits of different form of government like monarchy, democracy, oligarchy and stuff like that. And this is by the way like a century before Plato, right? Everyone knows the constitution, right? Everyone knows the republic, I should say. Um his dialogue, but actually one of the earliest extant discourses on different forms of government is found in Herodotus, who places it in the lips of random uh, Persian nobles in like the 7th century, I think. Uh, of course, completely historical, right? He's uh, just, uh, of course, writing the speeches himself, and the speeches are definitely not depicting anything that was going on intellectually in the Persian Empire at the time. He is just reproducing the political discourses that people had in his own time, right? Um, but after that, they agree on monarchy, which was the system that they had all along. They, of course, had to agree on that because that was what historically was the case in Persian Empire at the time. So the historical narration continues, right? Uh, but the problem is, who's going to be the next king? You have seven nobles, right? And as I said, they go about it the, the most stu the stupidest way possible. They essentially agree that at one particular morning, they will all take their horses out, and the owner of the first horse to whiny will be the next king. Uh, Winnie, sorry. Uh, the, the, the owner of the first horse to Winnie is going to be the, the next king. I think that's the English pronunciation, right? To Winnie? Uh, I guess he did like... <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, becomes the king. Uh, how did he do that? Let's read uh, some historical uh, Greek history. At the dawn of oh, at the dawn of day, the six came on horseback as they agreed. As they rode out through the suburb and came to the place where the mar had been tethered in the past night, Darius's horse trotted forward and whinnied. And as he uh, so did, there came lightning and thunder out of a clear sky. These signs given to Darius were thought to be foreordained and made his election perfect. His companions leapt from their horses and bowed to him. So his horse was the first one that we need. And of course, because that wouldn't be enough, that's really stupid, right? He immediately have this divine confirmation that this is the will of the gods, uh, that Darius was, if not foreshadowed or predestined to be the next god or uh, the, the next king of Persia, uh, at least the gods are okay with that, right? Uh, so you have this uh, basically double uh, fulfillment, double uh, confirmation of his divine right to rule. Uh, he wins by uh, the conditions that they agreed to, and you immediately have this divine confirmation by uh, uh, lightning and thunder out of the clear sky, which just couldn't be explained naturally. How do you explain that? Can't be storm, right? How do you explain that on the storm hypothesis? Uh, it says right here that the sky was clear, right? Just as it says that Jesus ate a piece of fish. Like people who hallucinate their dead loved ones don't hallucinate them eating fish. Come on. And post bereavement hallucination hypothesis can't explain this. Um, same difference, right? Uh, but here comes the hilarious part. Some say that this was uh, uh, Oeberes' plan. Oeberes' plan? How, how would it be spelled out in Greek? Oeberes, I guess so. Uh, but there is another story in Persia. See, here Herodotus is being a good historian. He actually tells you that there are different conflicting accounts. Uh, notice that this is something that the Gospels, as far as I can recall, don't ever do. Uh, in the Gospels, there is never any doubt about the events being narrated. They are just narrated very straightforwardly, right? 
the gospel authors, even though they are not always eyewitnesses to all of these events, at least in some cases they are not eyewitnesses at all, right? And never indicate any uncertainty. And you do you know where else we find that kind of certainty about narration in fiction? Fictional authors don't need to put forward conflicting stories about what happened to Luke Skywalker next because the events that they're describing didn't actually happen, right? Historians have to do that because they have to deal with the fact, and if they are good historians, they will proactively point it out, that there are conflicting versions about what happened and that if we are being good historians, we need to acknowledge that we are not always 100% sure. But that's just an aside. That's just a rant that automatically triggers in my head when I read this, right? Uh, so there's another story in Persia besides this, that he wrapped this mare's vulva with his hand, which he then kept inside his clothing until the six were about to go let go their horses at sunrise, when he took his hand out and held it to the nostrils of Darius's horse, which at once snorted and whinnied. So the alternative explanation, the alternative story, the alternative account, is that this was actually rigged, because as you can recall, there was a mare, uh, which is, I think, like a female uh, horse, right? Uh, I'm not actually super 100% on English zoological um, vocabulary, even though I should know that from playing like Stronghold and, uh, and um, Age of Empires, right? But anyway, uh, there was a mare, and the idea is that there was a guy who was basically conspiring with Darius, he, and he put his fingers inside the wares vagina. He then kept them in their clothing. And at the appropriate time, who, get, who put the fingers up the nostrils of Darius's horse. And that's what caused him to whinny earlier than other horses. Uh, so there you go. Uh, pretty hilarious, right? Ah. <sighs> Is there something happening with the stream? I think people are trying to reach me. Let me check. Oh yeah, this is about something different. Um, okay. So there you go. Uh, that was everything that I had prepared for today. Um, so I guess... Uh, Enjoy your New Year's Eve celebration. Uh, stay home and quarantine. Here we are actually instructed to uh, stay indoors. And uh, I think at most three people should meet. Um, honestly, I suspect that if the, the situation gets worse and worse, at some point they will even forbid us for, from being alone. Because the amount of people that can be uh, in the same room keeps, keeps getting smaller and smaller. Um, but yeah, I, the point is there shouldn't be any uh, New Year's celebration, at least here. Um, there definitely is not going to be any fireworks because there is a curfew at night at 9 a.m. on New Year's Eve, which is, yeah, that tells you that the situation is really, really um, serious. Uh, and of course, going to follow that, we will going to have a very relaxing a uh, very well, like, calm and quiet evening with my wife at home. Uh, I'm just going to put our daughter to sleep uh, around eight. I'll just open a bottle of wine and um, wait until this horrible here is over. <laughs> so I guess uh, see you guys next year. <laughs>